Thank you for joining us wherever you are around the world. As a matter of fact, I'm so grateful that we've got 15 different states and five different nations, Malaysia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Trinidad, Tobago, the Bahamas, Puerto Rico. I see you all, and I'm so grateful that you've joined us tonight on our Tuesday night Bible study. Thank you for being a part of our gathering tonight. I'm so honored and so grateful. Let me welcome you. For those who may be here for the first time, this is uh, our regular Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time Bible study. And we're right now in the midst of going through the book of Romans. And we're now at Romans chapter 12. One of the most, I, matter of fact, for me, at least in my life, this particular chapter has been one of the most impacting chapters in my life. And I'm going to tell you in a few moments what's so powerful and so impacting about it. But uh, I'm hoping that you will find it as impacting and as powerful as I have. So let me again thank you for joining us, wherever you might be. Um, I'm grateful for your presence and thank you for joining us tonight. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness to us, your tender mercies. You have extended to us a level of mercy and compassion that we recognize that we do not deserve. And we thank you, Father, for your loving kindness and your tender mercies to us. We pray that you would speak to us through your word. And I'm praying, Lord, in the same way that you have used this chapter to impact my own personal life, I pray that there are others who are joining, uh, joining us and watching this, this study will also be impacted, encouraged, challenged, motivated, inspired, Lord. Let the truth of your word resonate in their hearts and allow them to hear the truth of your message and apply it to their lives. Now, Father, if that person is unsaved, backslidden, unsure, uncommitted, I simply pray that you speak to them and challenge them to say yes to your will in the name of the Lord. Let us be an instrument for you tonight, Lord. I pray that we can be your mouthpiece and let, let your truth prevail in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. So we are in chapter 12, and again, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome. Let me again reiterate to you, he's writing to a church where people are combined, where the church is combined with both Gentiles and, and Jews that are part of this, uh, this church. And a great part of Paul's teaching is to resonate with the people of Rome and the, the church in Rome to understand that, again, and this has been going through throughout most of this book, that he reiterates the importance of understanding that we are saved by faith, by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that God raised him from the dead. And uh, we're not by works, not by acts, not by efforts of, not by human efforts are we saved. Most of what we've talked about leading up to chapter 12 deals with our, dedic our recognizing that we are saved solely by faith and not by any works or any actions of anybody. And that's, that's an important me message and lesson for us to learn. So let's, uh, let's dive into Romans chapter 12, and uh, we're going to start uh, by, let me read these first two verses to you, and we'll go from there as we read these first two verses. And these first two verses deal with li being living sacrifices to God. This is how it starts off, challenging us. He is saying to us that we ought to be people who are in a relationship with Jesus, and he's calling us to dedicate ourselves and be living sacrifices to the Lord. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let me read those two verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, <clears throat> that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. OMG, that's powerful. I hope y'all got everything he is saying. He, he begins by making an appeal to believers to present themselves has a sacrifice to God. He calls it a living sacrifice. And, and, and the fact of the matter is the problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps getting up off the altar. It keeps moving. 
A dead sacrifice lays there because it's dead. But he says, let's be a living sacrifice. We're alive, but he is saying, let us sacrifice our lives to the living God. And then he tells us, uh, again, he says, let us do this by the mercies of God and to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Let's take a look at this. He, he uses the word pre present. And here's what that word present. This is an important word. That word present implies and means that not just you are dedicated to God and sacrificed to God, but everything connected to you. Write that down. That's the deep meaning of that word. That God is calling us to sacrifice to him, not just ourselves, but everything connected to us. Everything that's a part of us, everything that is engaged with you, all your relationships, all of your conversations, all of your uh, possessions. He is saying, don't put yourself in a position that you are sacrificing everything, everything that you have to the Lord. And that's that's the call of God. That's what he wants us to do. That's what Paul is saying. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies and everything that you have as a living sacrifice. Living means it's alive, but a sacrifice. It's 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 fervent. It's it's awake. It's uh, we, we're sacrificing everything to God. And then he says, again, this is so powerful. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Let's 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 look at that. Holy means pure and consecrated. Here's what he's saying. Take what you have. Take what's yours. Take what's connected to you and consecrate it, dedicate it, present it pure to the Lord. Present it to God, you know, just take everything that you have that's a part of your life and consecrate it to God. The music that you listen to, the television shows that you watch, the books that you read, the magazines that you peruse. Present it and consecrate it to God. As a matter of fact. Holy means that you've, you, you're only, you, you have what's connected to you, those things which are pure. You're dedicating them to be pure before the Lord. Holy. And then it uses the word acceptable to God. That means that, now, ooh, 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 let me slow down. Let me, I, I don't want to rush through this, this verse here because it is one of those verses that altered my own personal life. Ask yourself the question, is what I'm doing now acceptable to God? Is it pleasing to God? If God were to hear the conversation that I'm having right now, if he's to hear this phone conversation or this in-person conversation, if he, if he were to hear me in dialogue with the person that you're talking to, would it be pleasing to him? Would you want him to turn off and away from the conversation? Or would you be able to say that the way I'm communicating and the way I'm dealing with this person it is acceptable to God. Would God say that about your conversations, about your thought life, about your dreams, about what you ponder in your mind, about what you meditate on? Would it be acceptable to God? Would it be pleasing to him? That's that's a heavy duty question that I need to ask. Is the music you're listening to that? Let me. I'm just trying to drive this point home. Is the music you're listening to acceptable to God? Now, many of y'all know I'm a Temptations man. I love the Temptations. Uh, my, my, my favorite group of all time, the, the Tempting Temptations. One time somebody bought me uh, some CDs that was the anthropology of the Temptations. Every song they ever made over the course of the history, 30 or 40 years of their music. And I loved the music, but some of the music there, I just could not, as much as I liked it and enjoyed it, I recognized me singing that song is not pleasing to God. You know, some of their music celebrated drugs and living high and living a life and doing things that's not acceptable to God. And some of those, some of those songs I had to put away. Praise him, somebody, somebody, um, Think about that. Think about the music. I, I, matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not presently a fan of today's music. I, matter of fact, I, I don't even know who the music artists are. 
as far as I'm concerned, they stopped making music today that's music. It's, it's uh, rapping and, and jumping and hollering and screaming and degrading women and, and promoting lifestyles that are the opposite of God. I can't get into it. I can't in, 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 engage in it. And those of us who say we want to present everything that's connected to us, to God, that's pleasing and pleasing to him and holy. You got to make a choice about what you are allowing yourself to listen to and what are the words and what are the what's the things that you're going to meditate on. You're going to have to ask yourself that question. What you know, am I am I willing to give up that some of these things so I can have a lifestyle that's pleasing and acceptable to God? And, and, it's, and it also says it's reasonable. Re, your reasonable service. And that matter of fact, that's what the end of the verse says. This is your reasonable service. This is this is what a, a normal person can rationally conclude. And that's what he's saying. You present to God what's rational to him, what. You know, this doesn't take a deep revelation. You, you don't need, you know, some deep revelation to understand this. This is, this is reasonable service. This is what anybody who has a relationship with God, this is how you worship him. And this is rational. It makes sense. What God is asking of us is not crazy. It's not off the deep end. It's not, he's not asking or requesting or requiring of us something that is unacceptable. And that's what God asks us to do. Let me read this verse to you again. I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you is what that it means. I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, and by the way, it means sisters too, by the mercies of God, by the fact that God will give you his mercy, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, everything connected to you, you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's the least you can do. And the fact of the matter is, with all that God has done for us, with every door that he's opened, every miracle that he's wrought, every prayer that he's answered, everything he's done for us, the testimony that he's given to you, with everything that God has done for you, doesn't he deserve for you to, doesn't it make rational sense? Doesn't it make reasonable sense for you to present everything that's connected to you to him and i say yes yes my lord you are you are worthy of all of that and more and then he says this matter of fact he goes a step further let's go to verse let's go to let's go to verse two here's what he says in verse two and that's a connection that's a conjunction do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I, this is a verse I call standing in the gap. And here's, here's what he's telling us. Do not embrace the world's ways. Don't allow yourself to be put in a place where you are conforming to the world. This is the problem with today's church. We see the world do something and we pick it up. And here we are trying to do what the world is doing. They, they do certain things and we want to bring it into the church and be like the world. And, and the fact of the matter is we, we need to be leading the world. We need to be the example of what God is calling. He, we should be embracing him. Don't embrace the world's ways. And that's, that's why I have a problem with the way people dress and the way people, what they do to their bodies and all these piercings and changing colors of your hair and piercing your nose and your ears. And I just, you being conformed to the world. That's what the world says is acceptable. That's what the world says is acceptable. Is it what God says? I'm, I'm not a fan of it. Some years ago, and I'm, and I'm contemplating bringing it back. One, uh, some years ago, I did a, a message from this passage, and I, I came out one day dressed like, and slowly got dressed like the world. And let's let people see what John Jenkins, Pastor John Jenkins would look like dressed like the world. If I, if I put on the attire of the world, if I wore the clothes of the war, world, if I pick up everything that the world put on, what would I look like? How would I be? Here I am trying to be like the world. 
And, I, and I'm saying to you all, God has not called us to be like the world. He's called us to be uniquely who he's created us to be. And I, and I could just preach this whole Bible study, but just to be on these two verses. Because I found them so powerful and life changing. It says, don't, don't embrace the world's ways. Instead, he says, be changed. Be transformed. And, and, and be transformed. That's what the word, the word transform means to be changed. And we do it by in, embracing and thinking differently and doing God's will. And what is he telling us to do? He says, when you do this, you are proving what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You, you, are, you are proving that God can be trusted. The word prove means to be trustworthy. And then he says, he says, this is how you prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect, and the perfect will of God. What's honorable before God, what's pleasing to God, and what's complete before God. Those are three key words, good, acceptable, and perfect. It means when you are transformed, when you change your way of thinking, you want to know what God's gap is, you want to be in God's good, acceptable, and perfect will, GAP, it's honorable, it's pleasing to God, and it brings you to a place of completion. And when I see somebody trying to be dressed like the world and act like the world and conform to the world, I'm saying to myself, there's a person who has not yet been matured, has not come to completion. Because when you get to completion, when you get into God's perfect will, you will be content and satisfied with how God made you. Ooh, that's, powerful. that's profound. I'm hoping y'all get that. You, you, you want to recognize and be complete with the way the Lord created you. Yeah, that's how, how, how did God create you? How, what did he make you to be? Be who God made you to be, not who the world. Not trying to dress like some, some movie star or some, some uh, uh, rock and roll artist or some music icon. Let's, let's not try to be conformed to them. Let's try to be like, let's try to conform to Jesus. Don't embrace the world. Instead, be transformed by the renewing, a new way of thinking. What controls your actions are the way you think. What controls your behavior is, are the way, is the way that you think. And God's calling you to think a different way. That's what he's calling you and I to do. He's calling us to be conformed. And so I want to stand in the gap. I want to be in the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I want to be in what's honorable before him. I want to be doing what's pleasing before him. Ask yourself the question, young ladies, when you're about to dress and walk out the door, will this attire be pleasing to God? And I want to be complete, perfect. I want to walk in God's perfect will today for my life. As a matter of fact, there's a perfect will for God for you every day from God. There's a perfect will for you every day from God. And you should ask God to help you be able to live and walk in a way that's pleasing and acceptable to him daily. That's verse 2. Now, let's, let's slide over to verse. Let me pick up. <clears throat> and I'm going to start and do verses uh, uh, 3 through 8 that talks about spiritual gifts. He's, he tells us about... He goes to the next place and tells us to use spiritual gifts. And I want to uh, challenge you to, to do that, that there's gifts that God has made available to you. Let's start at verse 3. Let's go to verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And let me let me stick a pen here and tell you this. God has given us grace. And we are to think reasonably, think humbly, because God has given us a level of faith to operate and to live our lives. And what this and here's what's powerful about this verse, that God has given grace to each one through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's what verse number three is saying. God extends to each of us grace and he gives us a measure of faith. God has given us the faith to function and operate as a part of his kingdom. And he wants you and I to know that and understand that he has smeared us with grace and that we're to think reasonably about ourselves. And don't put yourself at a higher level than you are. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. 
Come down off the come down off of that ladder. You're not all that you think you are. And matter of fact, whatever you are, you only got there by the grace of God. Only God opened opened up the door for you to be who you are. Uh, it's it's challenging to me that some people think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. But the scripture says, think soberly. That word soberly means seriously. Think seriously. Uh, and then think about this, that God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God has given you a portion of faith to live your life in the way he wants you to live. Verse number four says, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. We're many members, although we are many members, we don't have the same abilities or functions. We are different. We have different gifts and different assignments. And even though there's a lot of us, we are many members, but we don't have the same abilities or functions. Jot that down. We don't have, we, we don't have the same giftings. We don't have the same assignment. So, you know, that's, that's an important thing. God don't want you to try to be someone other than who he made you to be. And he doesn't want you doing something other than beyond what he's called you to do or to be. He wants you to understand that. Then, then he says in verse number five, so we being members, being many, I'm sorry, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we are many, but there's one body. There's a whole bunch of us, but we make up one body. We are conformed to be a part of one family and we are connected to each other. That's, that's what this means. We are connected to each other. We can't disconnect I know and I've met some people who want to be off by themselves. That's not how God created you to be. They don't want to be they don't want to be connected with the family. As a matter of fact, the enemy's plan is to get you separated. The, God's plan is to get you disengaged. That's what that's what God's plan is. That's what the devil's plan is. The devil's plan is to get you off by yourself, away from the family of God, on your own, separated from the body. That's the devil's plan. But God's plan is for us to recognize, uh, according to even in verse five is saying this, we're many, but we're one body in Christ and individually members of one another. That means we can only survive connected to each other. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's family. I want you to say to some people, as a matter of fact, this is a verse that tells us God never called you to be off by yourself separated from the body of Christ. I know there's a bunch of people staying at home and uh, dis disengaged and disconnected from the family of God. That's not the will of God for you. That is not God's will for you. He wants you to be plugged into the family, into the members. We need each other. Body, and, and the eyes can't go off and be by itself and think it, uh, it can accomplish anything by being alone and by itself. It needs the hands and the feet and the hands and feet can't do. They can't see what they're supposed to see to go where they're supposed to go without the eyes. You know, the feet can't be over by themselves. They can't go alone. They need the legs. We, we, we need every portion of our body. We need every person to be in the place that God's called them to be. We need everybody to be in the place and have the assignment and function in the role that God has called you to function in. Then in verse 6 to 8, let's slide over there. Here's what he says. Let me read those verses. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Stick a pen right there. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Again, God gives each of us grace to use the gifts that he has given to us to use. You have grace to use and you have a portion of grace and faith, by the way. God has given you grace to do what it is he's called you to do. And he gives us, he, he, he slides down here and gives us these seven gifts. And I want you to know that these are called motivational gifts. Let me spend a moment and talk about this. These are called motivational gifts. And what are motivational gifts? Let me slow down. The gifts are given to us in three categories. And, and tonight we're just going to talk about the motivational gifts. The, you know, the gifts are outlined 
uh, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. That's another topic, another teaching. But here's the three different categories. The first category is motivational gifts. I'm going to come back and talk about that in a moment. Let me go ahead and talk about this is what motivates you. This is what inspires you to do what you do. Are the motivational gifts. It inspires you to move and do what it is that you do. So those are the motivational gifts. What motivates you? Then there's what's called the ministry gifts. This is this is where you function. This is what you do. You get motivated by one thing, but you function in a different area. You function in a gift. And that's a whole nother set of gifts. By the way, we have a spiritual gifts class. Some of you might probably need to take it. And then we have thirdly what's called the manifestational gifts. These are the manifestations of the spirit of God doing supernatural things beyond your ability. These are gifts that are demonstrated and function in ways beyond your natural abilities. This is when God shows himself strong and mighty through human beings. It's how God shows his power through us. And we want to see God's power. So so right here in Romans 12, though, he gives us the seven motivational gifts. And let me just go through them one at a time. Let me just look at them for just a moment and look at them. Verse number um, six. If prophecy, he says, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. So there's the first one is prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy means to proclaim future events. It's a it's a motivation that God can inspire you, motivate you to want to see or to reflect what's happening in the future. Some some of you probably don't realize that you have the gift to see how God can and you're motivated to help people become in the future what he wants them to be. And, 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 and sometimes you can use that gift to speak to somebody to help them see where God's trying to take them in their future. Uh, I remember I remember being um, disheartened at a portion at a time in my life and a person that I didn't even know spoke and and this gift was evident that this person saw me pastor in a church and prophesied that they could see that in my life. That's what the prophecy does. That's the gift. Then he says this in verse number seven or ministry. Let us use it in our ministry. That word ministry means to serve. Uh, the root meaning of the word is to wait on tables. You are motivated to serve others. You are motivated to uh, uh, be hospitable and to serve other people. So there are people in our church that got this gift. They, they're motivated to help take the burden off of people from doing things. And so they they, quote unquote, wait on tables. They serve them. Verse verse number seven. He who teaches in teaching. That word teaching means you you are motivated for people to know truth and you want to give them instructions. You are motivated to help people see truth. Help them have a deeper understanding. You want to help people come to a place of a deeper understanding of the truth and the knowledge of God. That's verse number that's number uh, that's in verse number seven. Verse eight or uh, he who exhorts. In exhortation, that word exhortation means to urge or to comfort, to have the ability to motivate and urge or bring comfort to somebody who's in distress. God an, a, gives you, anoints you to make proclamations to someone to urge them to stay the course and stay in the battle, to keep moving forward. You have a motivation to help people do that or to bring comfort to somebody who's in a trying time or a challenging uh, season of life. Verse number eight. So he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality. Uh, some of you uh, have the gift of giving. That is to use what God has given to you to distribute or impart and to do it with simplicity is what liberality means. Is that I, I want to take the resources and I'm motivated to take what I have and utilize it to be a blessing and to impart or impact or bless somebody else. And I do it not with fanfare. I'm not trying to be seen, get my name called out. His encouragement is to do it with simplicity. That's what he says when he 
when he says in this passage, do it with liberality. Do it, do it simply. Do it without fanfare, without trying to make a name for yourself. Do it with simplicity. He who leads with diligence. That's the person who's, the, who's motivated to, head, to be the head, to manage. Who, he says, do, do this with, um, uh, with diligence. That word diligence means that we do it with eagerness. We are eager to lead. I, I know we've had seasons in our life where uh, we've had ministries that we wanted people to lead, but nobody uh, felt led to lead. And so my, my prayer is that God raises up somebody with this uh, leadership mantle that want to lead certain ministries. As a matter of fact, we, if we don't have a leader for a ministry, we won't have a ministry. We'll shut it down. And we've had to do that in the past. But I'm grateful and praying that God continues to raise up people who are willing to be managers and be willing to do it with eagerness. And finally, he uses this term mercy. That means to have pity, compassion. He says to to have this. And matter of fact, this is one of my this is one. Of, this is my motivational gifts. My, this is my mer- motivational gift is mercy. I have compassion. I feel the pain of other people. Um, and, and the instruction is to do and, and to move uh, with, uh, your, with your mercy, with cheerfulness. Do it with a smile on your face and a, and a heart of, of uh, kindness to others. Um, and so everything I do, I'm motivated I am motivated because I have a heart of compassion and mercy. That's the place that God has put in my life. That's my. And so these are the motivational gifts, prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership and mercy. The seven gifts somewhere in your heart. When you receive the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, one of these will resonate with you and understand this is what motivates you. It may not be what you do. But it will be what motivates you. We call these the motivational gifts. And so God wants to motivate us to do that. Now, let me that's that's the challenge from him in verses in these verses. uh, Verses three through eight is to use the spiritual gifts that God has given us. Now we go to verses nine through twenty one where he gives a string of Christian behavior of how Christians ought to behave it is it is the call of God to say to us, this is what our behavior ought to look like. And it starts in verse nine. I'm going to walk through one verse at a time. What does he say? Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. There's a series of things he says right there. First thing he says, love without Hypocrisy. The word hypocrisy means pretending. It's a hypocrite. The word hypocrite is to play act, to pretend. That's what it means. He says, let's love, let's show love without pretending. Let's let's be genuine in our love. Let our behavior toward other people be a behavior of love without pretending. And let's let's abhor. That word abhor means to hate, despise. What is evil when you see something that's not right, that's that's wrong, that is the opposite of God. Hate that, but cling, love, hold on to what is good. Connect with what's good. Find what's good. Love what's good. Embrace what's good. Cling to it. Hold on to it. Hate what's evil and love. Let us love one another and let's not pretend. That's verse nine. Verse 10 says this. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Here's what that means. That means that we are to treat each other with with Christian love and we are to give honor to each other. And I like that word honor. It means that we give value to each other. We don't demean each other. We give honor. We extend to others honor some of you need to, some of us need to learn how to honor other people we can be disrespectful we can be dishonoring we can embarrass people shame people but the call of god 
Christian behavior is we're to treat each other with the kind of love that Christ gave to us. That's what God called us to do. This is to show the show the love of God to each other. That's what we are called to do, that we are to demonstrate Christian love to one another. Show treat each other Christian love and give honor. Look for ways to honor other people. Look for opportunities to honor them. Look for situations where you can demonstrate honor. That's verse 10. That's Christian behavior that we honor. Verse 11. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That means this. Don't be lazy or slow with doing what the things he's in suggesting and in challenging us to do. Not lagging, not not behind, not waiting for other people to step up and do it. You do it. Don't lag in being diligent in doing these things. In fact, he says, be fervent in spirit. That word fervent means has zeal, rush to do it. Be quick uh, to do it uh, because we're, we're, we're servants of God. We're serving the Lord and we ought to be quick to show honor. Be quick to show love. Be quick to demonstrate Christian love. Excuse me, Christian love to each other. That's that's the call and the mandate that God gives us. And that's what we ought to do. Verse, verse 11, verse 12. Says this. Verse 12 says rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. That means let's be let's be glad with the hope that we have. We, we are people of hope. We're people of faith. Uh, somebody asked me the other day the difference between faith and hope. Because we are people of faith, we have hope. We have hope in our future. We have faith that God's going to work out a particular thing. Therefore, we can have hope. And he says, for us, be glad with the hope that we have and hold on when you're in the middle of afflictions and, and keep on praying while you're in the middle of the challenges that you're in. Hold on while you're in the middle of challenges and frustrations and disappointments and issues while you are in affliction. Continue in prayer. Keep on calling on the Lord. I, we ought to be people of prayer that we're praying and believing God and we stay steadfast. It doesn't matter how long it takes God to respond or answer. We are to continue to be people of prayer. That's what we're that's what God is commanding and challenging and beseeching us to do to be people of prayer. Verse 13 says this. Here's verse 13. Let's look at verse 13. Uh Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Here's even a more practical way of us to be demonstrating love and walking and how to be fervent and quick to respond and how we can serve people and serve the Lord. We are to distribute to the needs of the saints. How can we demonstrate Christian behavior? Finding a need and serving that need. When I first became the pastor of First Baptist Church of Glenarden, we had 32 auxiliaries. And basically those auxiliaries were, ministry, were organizations. I, I won't even call them ministries. They were just organizations, auxiliaries of the church. And all they really did was celebrate anniversaries. Anybody who's been a part of our church 35 years ago would know that we, that's what we did. We had afternoon anniversaries at 3.30 on Sunday afternoons with a different auxiliary celebrating an anniversary. One of the choirs, the ushers, one of the usher boards, uh, the willing workers, the Good Samaritan Club. We had all these clubs, but we were, we were inwardly focused on ourselves, and all we did was celebrate anniversaries. And when I became the pastor, we started learning about the role and the work of ministry, and the first thing we did was challenge the 32 ministries to go and meet the needs and distribute to the needs of the saints and in the community. And I'm so proud of our church. I'm so proud of those auxiliaries because that's exactly what they did. They went out and found needs in the communities, in our community, right here in, in right in Glen Arden. And they began to serve needs. And all of our ministries, all of our 128 ministries, hear me clear, all 20, 128 supposed to still be doing the same thing. And I believe most of them are. Distributing to the needs of the saints and not just the saints, but finding the needs to serve in the community. This is how we honor God. This is how we demonstrate the love of God. When we go to the nursing homes, when we go to the prisons, when we go to the hospital, when we go to the halfway houses, when we go places where people have needs 
and take resources and serve those needs. That's the call of God. This is how we demonstrate the love of God. I'm so proud of our ministries because that's what most of them are doing. And this is what the instructions of the scripture tells us to do. Distributing to the needs of the saints. And it says given to hospitality. So we're to meet the needs of believers and we're to demonstrate and be hospitable. Matter of fact, First Baptist Church of Gnarton is one of the most hospitable churches you could ever attend. If people come to our church, they feel our hospitality. They feel the love that, they, that our church demonstrates. We are good at that. Let me salute and celebrate the hospitality ministry. Let me celebrate the first touch ministry. Let me celebrate the ushers. People feel love. We demonstrate hospitality when people walk through those doors at, uh, at our worship center or our ministry center or even in our empowerment center. When people walk through those doors, the attitude and the culture of our church is hospitality. And I want you all to know how proud I am that that is exactly what you all do. God is pleased that that's what we do. Let me keep on going because my time is running out. Let me roll over to verse number 14. It says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And I say that that's that we got to learn to speak positively about those who seek to hurt you. Speak positively. Don't curse people. They, they might curse you, but you don't have to curse them back. They might call you a name, but you don't have to call a, call a name back. They might talk evil of you. But because you are a Christian and you have Jesus on the inside, you don't have to reciprocate. When you when you curse somebody who cursing you, you've allowed them to lower you d- down to their level. Ooh, I said something right there. When you curse them, when you curse them back, when they curse you and you curse them back, you've allowed them to lower who you are. And that's not what we're called to do. We're we're called to be above that. Some of you need to go to the, some people that you have said nasty things about or said nasty things to them and asked them to forgive you. That that's not the way a Christian is beho- is supposed to behave. Matter of fact, right here in verse uh, fourteen, it says, "Bless those who persecute you. Speak speak uh, speak speak kindly. You bless and do not curse." That's Christian behavior. Yeah, they might say all kind of nasty things about you, but you don't have to reciprocate that. You don't have to treat them the way they treated you. Verse 16. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I like that verse, too, because it says basically be, be glad with those who are glad and cry with those who are crying. Learn to have a level of compassion toward other people. If they're rejoicing, we'll celebrate with you. Pastors got to learn how to do this. You got to learn to shift your emotional status when you with somebody. And when somebody comes in and they're rejoicing, we rejoice with them. And then somebody walks right in afterwards and they're crying and they're in pain. You weep with them. You you cry with them. Yep. So um, my my appeal and, and suggestion and um, cry out to you today is to to learn by the power and presence of God to be sensitive to people when you're ministering to them and learn to rejoice with people who are rejoicing and weep with those who are weeping. Verse 16 says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. That's verse number 16. And here's what he's saying. Live in peace with each other. That's what that means. Live in peace. And don't think more highly of yourself. Matter of fact, this is the second time he's he has challenged us in this one chapter about thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to. And I and I say to you, live in peace with one another. Learn to live in peace with each other. Matter of fact, we'll talk about it in a moment. And don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. But in fact, walk in humility. Y'all have heard me talk about humility so much. God loves humility. God resists the proud, but he gives Grace to the humble. You humble yourself. God will smear you with his grace. He will empower you to be everything he's called you to be when you walk. You walk in humility. And that's how you live in peace with each other is you. You lower your thinking of yourself. and Don't think that you are so high and mighty. That everybody got to bow down to you. No, no, no. Nobody has to bow down to you. Verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. I'm coming to a close here, but here's again. His, his, his 
instructions to us with, with dealing with somebody who's not treating you right. Repay. Here's what he says. Don't respond to evil with evil. Now I put it. That's the word the way I put it. Just because somebody treats you evil. Don't you treat somebody evil back? That's not what Christians do. That's not what people who have the presence of God in their life do. That's not what those who are filled with the power and presence of God do. We don't treat. We don't respond to evil with evil. In fact, what we do is we do good uh, before all people because we know people are watching us. So we're going to do good all the time. That's what we're called to do. We do well. We do good. We treat people well and with the love of God. That's what the Lord has called us. How we are called to live our lives is to respond to evil with not with evil, but with good. As a matter of fact, I'm running ahead of myself because um, that's what these, that's what uh, these verses will get ready to tell us. Verse number 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Do everything in your power to live at peace with everybody. Do everything in your power to live at peace with people. Don't, don't, don't let it be said that we, 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 we had issues, but we couldn't get it resolved because of you. The truth of the matter is God is calling you. Make sure that it, you've done everything in your power to make sure that that uh, uh, there's peace. Now, you know, I know some of you, I feel tension in the room that people say, you know what? I've tried to live peace with somebody, but I, I wasn't able to. Uh, we weren't able to get it resolved. Just make sure that you do your part. Make sure you you extend the olive branch. Make sure that you show the love. You ask for forgiveness, even if you don't think you did wrong. You ask for forgiveness. Live peaceably. Do your part. Because that's what Jesus did for us. Even though he never sinned, he took upon himself the wrong and the sin so that we could have peace with his father. Oh, my God. He laid down the example for us. That's what Jesus shows us that we need to do. So do that as much as possible that you're able to do. Verse, verse number 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give peace, give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This is a verse I quote it all the time. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. Here's what I believe. I believe that when you decide to take vengeance and pay somebody back for how they wronged you, God says, oh, I see you got this. Oh, I see you going to handle this. So I'm going to take my hands off and I'm going to step away since you since you got it. And guess what? You don't want to have it. You want God to have it because you know what happens when God has it. When he when God, he said vengeance is mine, I will repay. That's what God says. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says, says the Lord. When God pays them back, they will show enough to be paid back. But they won't get paid back if you stick your nose in the situation and you try to stick your attitude and your mouth and your posture in it. God cannot do it. He steps away. He said, I see you got it. Some of y'all need to memorize this verse and remember that God says vengeance is mine. I'll do the repaying. So that's 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 important. Verse 20. Therefore, here's another powerful verse right here. Therefore. If your enemy is hungry, feed them, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. When they do you wrong, you do them good. When they lie on you, you speak well of them. As a matter of fact, the scripture said, if they're hungry, feed him. If they're thirsty, give them a drink. And when you do that, when you bless them, when you do good to them, you are heaping coals of fire. God says you are heaping coals of fire upon them. When you do that, that's the call of what God has called us to do. And it's my appeal to you today. Some of you got relationships and people right now that you need to be heaping coals of fire upon their head. There's some people who have hurt you, lied on you, treated you wrong, dis despised you, shamed you, done a bunch of things to you, got you fired off your job. They done done so many things, spoke evil of you. They've done a whole bunch of things to you. But guess what? The scripture is crystal clear of what God is calling you and I to do. He's telling us that he's calling us to don't take don't you take revenge, but instead. Let God repay him, but you do it by doing well in kindness to them. Verse number. I'm, I'm so far behind here. I got a little bit here ahead of myself. It's, 
uh, here's verse 20. And here's verse 21. Overcome evil by doing good. Verse 21. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That is the call of God is for you to overcome evil by doing good. Now, I I see I got a bunch of questions here and um, I don't I'm, I'm, I'm right up against my eight o'clock time. Let me see if I could see if I can answer at least one of these questions. How do I know what gift God gave me? So so the part of us learning these gifts and me spending a little bit of time tonight was me, for me to just try to give you the opportunity to understand, first of all, the motivational gifts. So ask yourself, what motivates me? So I, I, I had to come to the understanding that my motivational gift, what motivated me to be a pastor, I operate as a pastor. That's my gifting of what is, of my ministry gift is 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 leading and or administration. That's my ministry gift. But what motivates me to do that is my compassion for people, my love for people. I love people. I love you folk. And I, I feel your pain. And I want to I, I was evangelist going from church to church to church and uh, thought that that was going to be my life. But I started going back to churches and seeing people and I had a compassion to want to see them become everything God wants them to become. That's how the the uh, the pastoral gift was ignited in me. The administration gift of organization came to light in me by me wanting to see people mature and get seasoned. And and so uh, the way you learn about it is by studying it. And the way you learn about it is looking for the opportunities of how God moves your heart. Learn to be sensitive to the way God moves your heart. Now, my time is up. It's, it's like two minutes, two or three minutes before eight o'clock. And I'm trying to be straight. And I, I got a bunch of questions here. And um, I, you know what? When we come back next week, I will try to answer uh, these gifts, these questions, I'm sorry, that are being asked uh, at the start. So join me next Tuesday. And before I get into the lesson next Tuesday, I will try to answer some of these. I'll try to answer all these questions because I see I got a bunch of them before I get into the teaching next week. OK, thank you all for joining us today. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful from the depths of my heart. I'm thankful that you uh, join me every Tuesday night. I'm, I'm humbled and honored that you you come and join me every Tuesday night. It's my divine privilege and honor to have you. If you're not saved, there's a, there'll be a phone number that's going to pop up in just a moment that you can call and somebody can introduce you to Jesus. Or you need to rededicate yourself to the Lord. Um, there will be a, a, a number you can call or, or an email that you can uh, send an email to and we'll, we'll communicate back to you. Or you can click the link. We'll take you to a page and walk you through the process. I cannot think of a better church for anybody to be a part of than Verse Baptist Church of Lenard. And, and It doesn't matter where you live. You can live on the other side of the world. You can be a member of our church. And it would be our honor to have you as a part of our church family. It is my prayer that God helps you to walk in these things that are being taught in Romans chapter 12. That you can love those who don't treat you with love. That you can walk in, that you'll walk in humility and not think more highly of yourself than you ought to. That you can do good to those that despitefully use you. You can... In fact, allow the power and presence of God to give you strength and power to be able to make peace and walk peaceably with all men. That is my prayer for all of you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, I just intercede for the people of God. Thank you for all of those who join us every Tuesday night in Bible study. I pray that you will make yourself strong in their life and direct their path. In the precious and mighty name of our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good night, everybody.